This is what oral historians do. <laughs> <laughs> What is your name, and is there anything significant to your name? Whoa! Uh, my name is Peter Lawrence Lassen. Uh, Lassen is a relatively rare Danish name. My family, my parents are immigrants from Denmark. There is, in Northern California, uh, a Lassen National Park. It was, at the time it was discovered, the only live and active volcano in the continental United States. Since we've had Mount St. Helens yeah. and some other explosions. Uh, but Mount Lassen was the only active volcano. It, it, it was late 1800. Um, it has since gone dormant. Uh, so there's some mud pits and bubbling pools, but uh, that's about it. Uh, and his name, the guy that dis found it, distant family, was named Peter Lassen. I was not named after him. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of cool having a mountain and a volcano named after you. you know. uh, it turned out he was kind of a rotten guy. Do all, do all of you know about the Donner Party? Yeah. The, the, uh -huh. He was second fam famous to the Donner Party for leaving settlers in a snowstorm out by Marysville. And uh, they, the, the word is they ate each other. Uh, so, he was not a good guy. All right, next. Um, where were you born and where were you raised? I was born in Los Angeles. Uh, after World War II, I was born in 1939. Uh, World War II broke out in 41. Did I get that right? For us. Uh, yeah. 41. Uh, <laughs> for us. <laughs> for us. Not, not Denmark, by the way. In Denmark, it was 39 that they were invaded. Uh, I'm steeped in Danish history. <laughs> That's the nature of the son of an immigrant. Uh, you sort of know stuff like that. Uh, anyway, uh, after the war, my parents took us back. I have a brother and a sister, so we, we part of my young, young upbringing was in Denmark. And uh, my father worked for the FAO, which is Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, and uh, so we were back and forth. But as I say, much of my schooling was in Denmark, much of it here. Uh, I went to a college in Minnesota for my undergraduate work uh, and was drafted into the military immediately after I graduated. So. What part of LA did you grow up in? An area called Baldwin Hills. Okay, uh, so. you know, Do you not know it? Baldwin? Baldwin. Baldwin, as in Lucky. Oh. Oh. Uh, it's over towards uh, the Park. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever go to the Holiday Bowl? We did. Um, I went to Oh, wow. Uh, I got in a little trouble. Uh, so they switched me over to Lutheran High School, which was down near uh, Florence and Crenshaw in that area. Uh, That's a great from, school. It, it, was, it was a pretty good school, a little rigid for my taste, uh, but a pretty good school. And then I went on to a small college in Minnesota called uh, St. Olaf College. Mm -hmm which is notable from its music. Uh, that, that, uh, it was a very good school. I, I learned a lot. So, where, where did I grow up? Yeah. <laughs> All over. All over. All right. All right. By the way, on his car, his vehicle, he's got DK in the back for Denmark. Mm -hmm. That's the internet. That's right. Literally. He lets you know he's Danish. <laughs> Which usually those of us who have that sort of thing are letting other people know you speak the language. Uh, so that's the intent of it. Um, Danish is not a world language, but having grown up, I actually grew up trilingual. Uh, in my grade school, there was a, an experimental Spanish-speaking project. Uh, and of course at home we spoke Danish and then in the real world we spoke English. 
So I grew up trilingual, and uh, languages have always been very important. Uh, oh, this is a fun question. What's your favorite place in Southern California? My house. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice house. It's it's a weird, odd thing that I would, as an architect, I would never design anything like that. No, I love it. It's sort of funky and odd and strange. It is in Echo Park. It has, it's right next to Dodger Stadium. Uh, like my property and Dodger property touches. Uh, the wonderful thing about it is when there's no Dodgers game, and I stress when the crowds aren't there. Uh, great view out over downtown LA. Uh, and yet I'm in the middle of an Asian park, so there's birds and trees and coyotes wandering through regularly. Uh, it's, it's just kind of a neat little place. How long have you lived there? 30 years. <laughs> oh, he didn't tell you, but part of that house has a prime swimming ramp. It is just marvelous, and he does superb gardening on that site. What's his gardening like? What do you do? Uh, well, what, what my intent was, was to make my house, which was built in the, in the 50s, uh, by a well-known Southern California house builder. Uh, I won't call him an architect. I'm an architect. I have the, the, the training for that. But a, a well-known house builder at the time. Uh, and the, when I bought the place, I wanted to make it as totally accessible as it possibly could be. I don't want to own a place and then not be able to fully use it. Uh, so that required a lot, of, it's, it's on a hill, a very steep hill, uh, that required modifying a lot of steps and, and other things, taking out some stuff, and then putting in trees and bushes and things like that, but I can get all the way down through in my entire garden, and I have about an acre of land, uh, just short of an acre of land, that uh, has some nice switchbacks. So I can go down the hill. Yeah. What do you grow? What do I grow? Um, I have been growing some uh, a Japanese plum. I have um, a lot of fruit: uh, apple, blood orange, regular orange, lemon, lime. And you've never shared? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have those poppies, have the white poppies with the yellow... The Matilla poppies. Matilla. I always yeah. forget the name, but they're just gorgeous. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. They look like Friday. Is she allowed to visit? Sure! You have to sure. show you this place. It's really... He's got a guest bedroom, a bed, guest unit. He's been very helpful to me. Oh. Because one time I had a guest, and I needed to put up somebody I had to have a place for. Yeah. And he uh, accommodated her. Not yet. Oh, that's right, the retaining wall fell, so I couldn't put anyone in. Your retaining wall, yeah. Not mine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, his was the fall. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, how do you define feminism? How do I define feminism? I consider myself a feminist. Um, I have lots of women in my life. And on the surface, of course, equal pay for equal work is critical and we're not there yet. But I also think honoring women's ideas, uh, that, that listening, some people are talking constantly, so I have to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but listening. You could say to be quiet. That, that's true. But it wouldn't uh, work. It doesn't work. <laughs> what? <hasn't> <laughs> It is basically pushing for we males and women. My mother never considered herself a feminist. Uh, my mother never considered herself a feminist. She uh, said, you know, I'm liberated. She was a powerhouse. She, she was a very strong woman. Uh, Said I'm liberated. You yeah, know, it's okay. But then I've seen so many women not being equally treated. 
And of course, that's absolutely unacceptable. When I lived in the South, I lived both in, in uh, North Carolina and in Georgia, and uh, I saw how women were put in their place. When I was in Vietnam, I certainly saw how women, Oriental women, were treated as having a defined job, and that's what you're going to do the rest of your life. Uh, that's unacceptable. That, that women really need to have a place where they can do what it is they want to do, uh, as we men have done for the last centuries. Um, I look at women in the Muslim world, and I know a number of them, I, I've known a number of Muslim families, where the Muslim women have told me that they feel equal but separate from their male counterparts. Um, the idea that they can't inherit land is unacceptable, not in all Muslim countries, but in some. Um, so it's sort of in there, do I, do I have a, a, a fairly, a fairly tight definition? No, I don't. Uh, but I always have feel a little, little, uh, a little put off at a rigid definition that, that it, they never take in the universe of that subject. Does that help me? Yeah. It's a hard question. It is a hard question, uh, but it's a very good question. And I, I certainly a man that was profoundly affected by the 60s. Uh, went through the era of women's lib and all that, and, and much of that has been forgotten, of course, at this point, bra burning and things like that. Um, they were important. It was necessary. And, I, but, and they were successful to some degree, but not completely. We still don't have equal pay for equal jobs. We still have people like Roy Moore the uh, guy who's running for senator from Alabama, who says, I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, right. What or who motivates you to succeed? To find success. You define it. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. That's a logical sequence. Um, I, I was injured in service. Uh, I am a paraplegic. I have a spinal cord injury. Um, I would say that that kind of traumatic event in my young life forced me to either get out and succeed or become a vegetable. Um, when I got out of the Army, um, I came to the VA, my, my home hospital is VA Long Beach, um, and there were guys from World War II that were still occupying a hospital bed. That is truly unacceptable medical care, that, that you know, get out, get your life in order and go do something. And I vowed at that time I will never be one of those guys. It's just, I'm not going to allow it. So that was kind of a scary lesson to learn. I learned, keep learning lessons as I move along, you know, in life. Uh, but it's often things you don't want to be. And I'm not going to allow my disability to control me. Uh, that I control my body even though half of it's basically gone, I control my body. And you know, that, that kind of an attitude really opens up a lot of worlds to you. The, 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 I'm not going to be a victim. No. Press on, as they say in the military. 
But I also want to say that Peter helped me understand something. Whenever I get now uh, an appeal for money from the power, for the Special Olympics, mm -hmm. I write them back and say, I'm not going to give you money because I don't think, I don't believe in the Special Olympics. If you are able to do whatever it is that is being done, with that, except for wheelchairs, you do have an advantage rolling along. Yeah. I can never compete with that. But if you can compete, then just compete. Don't tell me you're intellectually, you know, this or that. Just get out there and do it. Right. And if you can make it, make it. Now, I'm not giving you money until you treat people that way and let them compete on absolute equal terms. And I will tell you that I run, I, I actually quit two years ago. I have run 55 and a half marathons in my wheelchair. I saw that online. That. <laughs> you saw I, that online? I, no, I, there was on the LA Times. I was search, I searched up his name, and there was like they listed the times, and it was really cool. It's cool. It's cool. My best time is three three hours and ten minutes. So I I started when I was forty. What's the best time for a runner? Oh, wheelchairs are always no, no, for so an actual runner. For, you know, run run with the feet. I have no idea. I thought the six-minute line was the deal, but I'm back in the Yeah, you're, you're, you're up there. The, the best wheelchair is one hour and I think 36 minutes. And the best male runner, because they distinguish between male and female, uh, the best male runner is still, I think, two hours and ten. Uh, something like that. There's a, there's a, a yeah. disparity of about... Uh, about 20, 25 minutes, something like that. But but the trouble with that is, it's it's technology, it's ball bearings. You know, I can go out and say, "Hey, man, I got ball bearings." <laughs> and, uh, uh, that 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 that's what's winning. Yes, there's a lot of work and time mm -hmm. and all that, but but. Uh, um, to rely on technology, that's what Oscar Petroius did with the South African runner who out later killed his girlfriend. Um, he, I, I'm so glad he ran in the regular running races. I think that's exactly what he should have done. That's where he belonged. On the other hand, I do think he benefited from that special C, C food uh, that made him faster, and, and that's questionable. Yeah, especially if people are willing to go under the knife to become better looking or better performers. Oh, well. Do we have to modify our bodies to compete? And, and he did. He had a, a disability. He yeah. had his, his leg removed at birth, or soon after birth. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there, there's that whole area of, and it includes the genetic modification issue too, uh, of modifying ourselves to do something, particularly like being an actor or a major athlete or, or some of the shallower things. Yeah, I know it's much So, uh, I have, well, can you tell us about uh, the Vietnam War? Like your injury? Oh, sure. Um, I was injured. I, mine explosion. I was in a mine explosion. November 21st, 1964. Does, does that date mean anything to you at all? Does, it, does anybody react to that date? Isn't it cool? It's, 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 like, it's like, no, anniversary of Kennedy? You're right in the right direction. It one day, it's one year less one day from the anniversary of Kennedy. Of what? Of Kennedy's death. Oh. Um, I bring that up because I was drafted. I bring that up because we thought at that time Kennedy wanted us to go. That, that of course you do that. I, you know, the, the great man, our government doesn't lie to us. And, you know, we love the Camelot thing of, of the Kennedys. And, 
all of that. He had been with him for a couple of years. Uh, he was, we thought, just this wonderful, great president with a magnificent wife. Uh, and all of this stuff, we believed it. I will tell you that my sister was marching in Berkeley at the time, anti-war. So I was well aware and knew all about that. Felt slightly betrayed. On the other hand, knowing she was right, knowing we don't know what the hell we're doing here. You know. Uh, we were advisory. Uh, I was working with some wonderful people that I like very much still to this day. Uh, and then I was in a mine explosion. Now that's a landmine explosion. Uh, a couple of the guys died. I survived. I was airy backed out and brought to back to my home station, which was Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, and there diagnosed as a paraplegic. My spine is, if you will, severed, uh, low on the, on the uh, lumbar, which lumbar is sort of right in here. This is thoracic up here. Chest level is, is thoracic. This is lumbar. Uh, what else can I tell you about it? Uh, that's how I got injured. How long were you in, in Vietnam? Uh, uh, three, four months, something like that. Mm. Uh, so it happened early. It happened early. Uh, and I was in the hospital a year. Uh, how, how old were you? I was 23, 24. I had my, my degree from college, St. Olaf College. Uh, and uh, so 23, I believe, uh, I can do a count uh, for you. Uh, I was athletic and it, it brought me in the best shape of my life uh, when I was in the service from you know, all the training that they put you through. Uh, really in good shape. And I went from somewhere around 190 pounds down to 90 pounds. So I lost 100 pounds during that year and, and uh, was in a coma for two months. I do not remember being evacuated. I don't even remember the mine. So none of that stuff is in my memory. Did you ever have any other body experiences when you were in your coma? Yeah. I, I would, I don't remember being in the coma. People said I acted nice. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that means. In, in other words, I wasn't bitching and moaning and complaining and powing and all of that. But if you're in a coma, it's a little hard. It's a little hard. It's, exactly <laughs> it's right. so pleasant. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I have had out-of-body experiences during my treatment and medical care and certainly coming out of it. Would you tell us about them? Oh, you don't have to. It's a, I don't mind. Um, I do remember once I was on an operating table, and apparently whatever drug they had going into me, I reacted to. So I, if you will, disappeared. But I remember floating, the, 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 some, I'd like to say spirit, mm -hmm. my spirit moved out of the body, uh, floated, So what was going on, hurt everything that the doctors and nurses were panic about, uh, panicking about because apparently my heart stopped, uh, and then brought back in. I did start down the tunnel. Uh, on the way to death uh, that I've heard described and was brought back from that. Uh, I do think there is a higher power. It's not the way I was raised, which was Lutheran. Um, 
it, it's not all of that sort of. Uh, it has nothing to do with math. Right. Uh, but going down that pathway, first, there was somebody there to meet me. It was a she. And told me it's not time yet. Um, the other thing is that move towards the end, the light at the end of the tunnel was there, and that gives you the sense that yes, there is more, more to it than that. But I am also valuable, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that there's there's you're connected to something much bigger. Than yeah, I mean, almost in the nir nirvana mm -hmm. sense. Uh, of the Buddhist sense, uh, as opposed to the typical rigid. And I have also had the experience of people coming to me, mm -hmm. an old girlfriend who uh, died, had, had uh, cancer metastasized, and, but the instant she died, I'm sure she went to her husband and, and all that, but, but she also came to me. Mm -hmm. and uh, Thank you for sharing that with me. You bet. It's really important to talk about it. I think so too. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I had a lot of people tell me I was crazy, and I'm like, okay. Oh, I don't think so at mm -hmm. all. Uh, but even if, if you if somebody crazy, said, that's fine too. It was a chemical reaction. Oh, okay. Sure. But it is, mm -hmm. and, and and I believe it, and that's the important thing. Thank you. Okay. So, what are you passionate about? Life. <laughs> That's really a dumb answer. <laughs> I think it's segue beautifully based on what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like my life. I, my life is good. Um, I have people that love me and who I love. Uh, yeah, I'm passionate about life. I, I want to experience it all. Yeah. <laughs> Does that is that good enough? Yeah. I'm going to go off script uh, go she had sent us a couple of articles I think that you had either like, been interviewed about and I think it would be like maybe like a, a speech you gave like in like the 70s or something about like just accessibility in general congressional testimony I think I think, uh, I think it was that one and you mentioned like airplanes and how it was like they were almost not accessible I wonder what's your like review on accessibility of airplanes like, they are almost not accessible yeah uh, the the aisles are getting thinner I travel a lot uh, in my work, and uh, just so you know, my my sort of focus in the architectural field is adaptive reuse, which is taking old buildings and modifying them for modern uses. Clearly, our, uh, removal of architectural barriers is part of that issue. Uh, my experience is that the aisles of airplanes are getting narrower and narrower. Now, that is under FAA rulings that the Federal Administration, the Aviation Administration, is allowing them to narrow to 18 inches. Clearly, the airlines like that because it allows them to pack more people in, like sardines, into, into, the, into the airplanes. Uh, but that's the that's the uh, economy section of the airplane. First class is wider. And interestingly, I can get my wheelchair down the typical first class aisle. So when I fly, I always try to get the first bulkhead seat, which means I can go down the aisle, first class aisle and sit in the first row uh, back there. When I go internationally, I try to get the very back one. Uh, that means I have to have assistance on and off the plane, which I don't like doing. You know, which one? Hmm? Which one? The very back yeah. seat. In the very top. So I'm near the toilet. But he doesn't like his task for assistance. Right. That, that's what that says. I don't like asking for assistance. My butt is small enough that the the seats, they're okay. They're not real comfortable. But luckily I'm not obese. And, 
then I don't have to worry about, I, I want a first class seat because I want to spread out. Uh, you know, my butt's skinny and, and that's, that, you know, makes it, the seat size okay. Uh, so that's, that's the way you are. Boarding and, and uh, deplaning, for the most part, is okay on Boeing and uh, the Airbuses. So, so both the, the American built and the, the European built. Boarding, uh, on the, boarding and deplaning on those is pretty good. Uh, Bombardier, which is a Canadian aircraft company, they have narrowed the entrance okay. ramp on t into the, the uh, door of the plane to the point where I cannot do that. My, my wheel goes off the edge. It's so narrow. So that's a problem. So does that help? Yeah. So well, just so you know, worse. when I went to the bathroom, I noticed there are no, <laughs> they violated ADA. You couldn't use it. Wow. Oh, no, the building is awful. Yeah. Well, what do people do here on, on campus? Is there a special one somewhere? Or I think that they're, they might have them depending on the floor. They have to, you have to know in advance. They also are required to modify if somebody, mm -hmm. let's say, has a bladder problem, mm -hmm. uh, that they have to modify it for them. But they have to know that they've got this construction that they've got to do. But you can't send people up, down, whatever flights of, of stairs. Mm -hmm. Elevators, of course, are here. But but you can't do that. It's it's got to be. There isn't a specific distance of, of between the classroom and the toilet. They By are. the way, in order to flush, you need to use your foot. You have to get over there. Huh. And so you don't put a lot of pressure in there. I don't think you have enough weight to push it. Oh, well, I was able to, but I'm thinking of you. You couldn't use it. Wow. Yeah. That, that needs to be yeah, straight they, they don't, yeah, they have it like near the floor, not where it's like a, a thing you have to almost like, so, so, like use your hand, maybe. Because I can use my hand on the foot pedal. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of crappy. You have to get down on your nose. That's right. But, but you know, that, that's so be it. But if it's way in the wrong place, then... It's ridiculous. Uh -huh. um, well, I just want to round up a comment. Yeah. I believe in interdependence mm -hmm. because I was in hospice care and I learned I was totally dependent from being totally dependent, independent. So in, in regards to you, I feel you have a, the legitimate right to ask for the help you feel you might want. It doesn't diminish you. I don't agree with that. I feel if he has a disability of a particular kind, a learning disability, with you, you're so independent, Peter, you don't need help, but, <laughs> but with you, I think in your condition, yes, absolutely, you should get help. Why not? And by doing so, you might help someone else who feels the same way. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I buy that, of course, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I, you know, my sense is, don't ask for it if you don't need it. If you need it, or if you feel you might need it, right. go for it. Do it. Uh, <laughs> I, actually, absolutely. Uh, the awesome. other thing to remember is that out of everybody here in the room, all of them have a disability of some sort. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. That that uh, you, you those those the things that are there for you may not benefit me. There are cheaters out there that are going to want extra time on the exam, and so they're going to. There, there's a, a case in LA Unified School District right now that somebody has put their child in that was not, not diagnosed, it was an ADHD case. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody has put their child under uh, the ADA rules for education, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, that IEP usually. I, I, an IDP, an IEP, or an IEP, 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 education, program. education program. And somebody got that for the kid and they were not diagnosed with ADHD and all that. Uh, so there are already people cheating on it. One of the things I have to have, have to, is the placard in my car, uh, the handicap that allows me to park in a handicap space. I have to have that because I, in order to get my wheelchair in and out, I can't.
parking standard with stall, I have to have that wider space next to me. Um, so what I'm suggesting is, first, there's a lot of people out there that are cheating. And it's so easy to say, oh, James, you don't look like, well, what are, what are we, we supposed to look like? You know, we're supposed to look like everybody else. Uh, you must ask for that if you need it. I, what I would do for my own self-righteousness is I will specifically ask for what I need. But no more. Mm -hmm. That's that's been the policy for a while. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I get it. What would the questions have been? I'm curious, as an oral historian, you know, what kinds of questions that you didn't. Uh, um, uh, I was actually going. It was uh, ask about his activism on behalf of people with disabilities. So. Oh, I'm very yeah, active I'm in that, that field. I usually working uh, with veterans. Uh, but much broader than that, of course. Uh, that that uh, veterans right now, first, we were treated pretty badly uh, at the end of Vietnam, uh, or during Vietnam. And when I think about, I, I'll get a little political here, uh, George Bush, when he decided to invade Iran, Iraq, didn't add any money for veterans. In other words, you go in there, he said it was going to be a short war. It's We are now in Afghanistan, the longest war ever. Uh, but providing no money for the particular medical care of vets was just atrocious. Can, how do you justify that? Well, he said it was going to be a short war. But people are still going to get hurt. It was just clearly not thought out. Uh, and I think, in general, vets the Vietnam era, we had some negative feelings about us. The, the general populace was not very good to us. I think now we're just forgotten. That, that people just don't think about it. Uh, and that's got to change. We're just, just a forgotten group. You better uh, say some people have forgotten. I would Lots say the general population. And have written about it. And I'll be, yeah, I'll just think of the one that Burns just did. Ken yeah, Burns. That, that was a very good thing for Well, when I mentioned some people, I support the Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. against the war and the Iraq veterans against mm -hmm. the war. These are two separate organizations. And they're always... Oh, yeah, they put, the, 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 the Vietnam ones put out a fabulous publication. What was the other question that you didn't ask? Okay. We, maybe you should change the script. Oh, no, I was just like, we like, just don't let me have like set questions, but I had made a note about like, oh, okay. I wanted to ask. Yeah. So. yeah, anything you want to ask that's not on the script, please do it. Yeah, question. feel free. Yeah. All right, who's next? Mention. What's your favorite food? And what? What's your favorite food prepared by your mom? <laughs> my favorite food prepared by my mom, who is dead, is Holcott Melfleur. What's that? What the hell is that? <laughs> it, <laughs> it's a Danish dish. Uh, um, what would I say? It's sort of a gelatinized red soup. Uh, What's the red? Uh, currants. Red currants. It's, it's a fruit soup. Uh, red, made with red currants. Uh, raspberry juice. I can make it. I can't think of anything. If raspberries are in it. So it, it's, it's very good. So next time you're in a Danish restaurant, we dust these things. What was the food? Write it down. <laughs> what, you, there, was another, there was another question. What's your favorite food? That was my favorite food. Oh. Uh, but I'm, I'm an omnivore. I like everything. 
Um, I have a favorite restaurant that serves something called pho. Uh, which is yummy yeah, soup. Love pho. What's your favorite restaurant? It's called uh, uh, Viet Noodle. On Glendale Boulevard in Atwater Village. Okay. And it's just, it's a North Vietnamese recipe, the, the founder told me. It's a North Vietnamese restaurant with noodles and basically chicken. Uh, and it's just a lovely pho. And I am a pho aficionado. I travel around the country and often will just say, okay, I'm in New York. Okay, well, I know this little pho restaurant <laughs> or little noodle shop or whatever. So that's something I like. Um, I will go out of my way for sushi. Uh, I am very fond of sushi. Uh, and I was in uh, a little tiny town called Mankato, Minnesota uh, at a conference here about a month or two ago and uh, sought out a Japanese restaurant and they had sushi and it wasn't very good. <laughs> But you're in the middle of Minnesota. You know, there's, you know, how many miles from the ocean? Uh, Two thousand miles from the ocean. But it was really nice to try, and that a restaurant could serve that and survive. You know, in the middle of nowhere. Like, you know, what the? Can you talk about your experiences in Washington D.C.? Sure. I. Uh, what years were you there? 1968, <clears throat> I was uh, asked to uh, to be executive director of a group called the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Uh, it's a group of all, all of us have to some degree a spinal cord injury. Uh, and the PVA uh, hired me as executive director that also at that time included basically being a lobbyist. So so I got in and out of places like Congress and got to know some of the Congress people and, and all that. It's a very nice job. Don't I know we hear bad things about lobbyists uh, generally, but it is an honorable job. Uh, they are important. The Congress people Congress is so screwed up right now that that's a whole other issue. Uh, they cannot know everything about everything. So to pass a law that you know something about the subject matter and how the law works, it really is honorable and important for you to get in there and tell them this is the way it should be. Now, I represented a, a veterans group uh, chartered by Congress uh, back in the 40s that gave me some voice, uh, having, having that as, as my credentials. Also having college education and all of that, that, that helped. Um, after I did that, I did that for a couple years, then the VA hired me as an architect, staff architect. Um, even though I did not have the credentials to be an architect, they pretty put me on as that. It was mostly planning. Uh, so I worked for the VA designing hospitals and, and parts of hospitals, mostly parts of hospitals, uh, for five years, and then was offered a job as chief of compliance for the federal agency that does ADA compliance. Uh, so we, we, when we got the laws passed, it was my job to ensure that the government was living up to its responsibility to make things accessible. Right? Uh, all, all those three jobs were absolutely fascinating. And then, by the way, after I did that, I went back to architecture school and got my degree from North Carolina State University so I have my Masters of Architecture from North Carolina State University. And then I came out here and got a job out here. And I loved Washington. Washington was not as insane as it is now. Uh, but 
at least Republicans and Democrats and independents talked to each other, dealt with each other. There was a, a, a sense of willing to compromise that I thought was very important. And that is, in my heart, what, what I think of as Congress. What I hear now, what I see now, it's deteriorated. Uh, and while I have been back to lobby for particular issues, uh, I think it's gotten so rigid, so ideological, that I really don't like to do them anymore. Yeah, that, that's cool. Thank you. Um, so, since this class is like focused on like women in American society, uh -huh. um, I wanted to ask about uh, your relationship with your mother. My relationship with my mother was very good. I will tell you that my mother, my father was a PhD uh, biochemist. My mother was a physical therapist. And uh, both immigrants from Denmark, as I said. Uh, my mother was a very strong woman. My father kind of didn't talk very much and sort of a little, little bit um, reticent, I would have to say. Uh, but she was, she was kind of a neat lady and she was one of those, I can do everything job. So, so one of the, one of the, I can do everything people. Uh, I have never seen my mother not be able to do things. That she was one of one of the early drivers. That, that women back in her time in the twenties were just beginning to get drive, driving. Well, when my mother came to this country in 1925 or something like that, first thing she got was a driver's license. Whoa! Uh, she raised. She had four children. She raised three children. Uh, one died early. Uh, she wasn't a very good cook, but those things she cooked was, were very good. Uh, we all remember our mother with food. 